Hey, welcome back everyone. We are in the uh, Blueprint uh, Outline, PDF Fillable Outline 8.0, Pharmacy Billing and Reimbursement. Pharmacy Billing and Reimbursement 8.0. All right, let's get started. This is a little bit of a long one, but not as long as uh, the first uh, two, number two and three. Okay, 8.1, Reimbursement Policies and Plans. Um, for instance, HMOs, PPOs, uh, CMS, and private plans. So we're going to be talking a lot about insurance insurance in this uh, lecture. Okay, so managed care. Uh, this provides both the financing and delivery of health care to its members. Managed care. Um, B, managed care organization. So a managed care organization is a health care organization that both insures and, um, and provides health care services to the patient, um, to the insuree. So again, a healthcare organization that both insures and provides healthcare services to the patient. Two, services are provided for a predetermined amount of money, this is like, it's called capitation, that has been negotiated and paid in advance, paid in advance. Services are provided by a predetermined amount of money that has been negotiated and paid in advance. So you, as the insured, um, through your employer, you're going to pay for one of these plans. You're going to pay a monthly fee, a fixed monthly fee, every single month. And uh, that's the predetermined amount in return for services um, and health care that you're going to get from the insurance company, from the managed care organization. C, pharmacy reimbursement for managed care. So, um, one, pharmacies are contracted with drug insurance companies or third parties for reimbursement for their services. The starting point for reimbursement claims starts with the average wholesale price. The average wholesale price, so that's the price of a drug, wholesale price of a drug, anywhere in all 50 states, including Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. So it's the same price for a drug with a particular NDC number everywhere in the United States on a, within a, on a given day, okay? Because we have to have some consistency on how we bill and what insurance companies are going to base their reimbursement on. So in the United States, the blank AWP is a prescription drugs term referring to the average price at which drugs are purchased at the wholesale level. So fill this in or write it in. In the U.S., the average wholesale price, the average wholesale price is a prescription drugs term referring to the average price at which drugs are purchased at the wholesale level. <clears throat> So the term was originally intended to uh, convey real pricing information to third party payers, including government prescription drug programs or plans. Um, a, the blank, publishes the AWP of every drug distributed in the United States, okay, including the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. The blank is the Red Book, R-E-D-B-O-O-K. The Red Book publishes the AWP of every drug distribution distributed in the United States. So uh, this is a common question on the exam. It'll say which book uh, publishes the average wholesale price of drugs in the United States. And it'll give you a list of choices. The answer you're going to look for is the red book. Three, a typical, uh, typical negotiated reimbursement formula between the third party and the pharmacy would be AWP minus some kind of discount plus a dispensing fee. So when pharmacies sign a contract with the um, uh, third party or insurance, they're going to make them sign one of these contracts to say, okay, for every drug that you dispense, we're going to reimburse you at AWP minus a percent plus a dispensing fee. So typically, as an example, let's say the AWP of a drug was $50 as published in the Red Book. And so the, uh, the negotiated reimbursement for the insurance would be something like AWP minus 12% plus $2.50 for a dispensing fee. Um, the difference between AWP and the net cost of a drug, the actual cost, is about 10 to 15 percent. Um, the AWP spread between the net cost and AWP is about 10 to 15 percent for brand drugs or proprietary drugs, and it's really it can be much higher for generic drugs between the net cost and the AWP for generic drugs. That's why pharmacies want to dispense generics wherever possible because their gross margin or profit margin is higher. Uh, the spread between the AWP of a generic drug and its 
and its net costs uh, can be any can be as high as up to 50 to 60 percent. So you can see why pharmacies want to dispense generics because they have a higher gross margin on generic drugs. And this uh, this thing is called uh, uh, they have a name for it. Whenever a pharmacy has the ability or opportunity to substitute for a brand drug with a generic, that uh, percentage is called generic efficiency. Okay, generic efficiency. I didn't write it here, that's what, but I want you to, to note it. Um, pharmacies that have a 90% or better generic efficiency are generally more profitable than pharmacies that are, have only like a 60 or 70% generic efficiency. So what that number means, 90% means 90% of the time when there is a generic available for a brand drug, that pharmacy dispenses the generic. And it's to their favor too because it's more profitable for them, right? Um, other starting points for drug reimbursement that insurers use, insurance is used, page two, <clears throat> the WAC. This is the wholesale acquisition cost. So this is another benchmark that pharmacies typically uh, purchase drugs at. Uh, the difference between what the pharmacy paid based on WAC and what insurance reimbursed the pharmacy uh, based on a AWP is known as the spread. So the difference between AWP and the WAC, that's the spread. The difference between AWP and the net cost, that's the spread. Okay. I feel like we're betting at, uh, in Vegas here. Um, one, this spread has been completely nullified by insurance payers or third parties and is the reason for the demise of independent pharmacies throughout the United States. So pharmacies basically don't have this built-in margin anymore because this WAC payment killed their, their margins. Uh, there's no spread between the net cost, which is what they actually really paid for the drug, and AWP because it was, initial, it was, it was pretty much just er erased by these uh, insurance companies because they got greedy. Two, the chain monopoly phenomenon that reverses this reimbursement process will be dis uh, discussed on a, on a video lecture. So, um, but I can talk about it really quickly here. So a chain has a monopoly now because there are only two chains left in America. Well, three, and soon to be Rite Aid is either going to be bought by Amazon or some other company. But right now you only have two chains, CVS and Walgreens. Before there were lots of chains, so these insurance companies pitted them against each other saying, we're going to pay you this AWP price minus a certain percent plus 250. And if you don't take it, guess what? Your competitor, the other insurance company, will take it. But now since there's only two chains, now it reverses. Now these two chains are dictating to the insurance companies, listen, there's only two chains left in America, us and them. So guess what? You're, we're going to tell you what you're going to reimburse us for our drugs because if you don't reimburse us for what we want to get paid, your population of insured people, your patients, your customers will have nowhere to go. Okay, so now it's reversed after all these years. It's kind of an interesting phenomenon here, what's going on. All right, B, the MAC. The MAC is, type it in or um, write it in, maximum allowable cost. So this was an early uh, benchmark that was used after AWP. And the MAC list is another price that insurers use to further erode margins for pharmacies. It generally refers to a payer or pharmacy benefits manager, PBM, generated list of products that includes the upper limit or maximum amount that a plan will pay for generic drugs and brand name drugs that have generic versions available. So it used to be in the old, older days where there were so many generics out on the market for the same drug, but they all had different prices. They all had different AWPs and acquisition costs, net net acquisition costs. And so what these insurance companies did, they didn't want to mess around. They just said, they just took the lowest the lowest AWP of one of, the, of all these generic uh, companies and said, we're only going to pay you that. So it forced uh, all the generic companies to uh, take a loss uh, or less profitability on their generic drugs. And, and, and um, pharmacies, they had nowhere to go. They had to do whatever these insurance companies made them do because they wouldn't get the business otherwise. They wouldn't be able to sign these contracts and no patients will come into their pharmacies. But again, it's a different story now with only two chains left in America, three including Rite Aid, but I don't think they're going to exist for much longer. C, AAC, 
actual acquisition cost. So this is the actual cost the pharmacy paid for the medication. Um, acquisition cost is your net net. So usually when a pharmacy orders drugs from the wholesaler, right, the, the prime vendor like McKesson or Cardinal or Mar Marisource Bergen, they're not really paying the AWP. They're paying the acquisition costs uh, from the manufacturer plus a percent. So the, and the, per the percent depends on how much business they give to the wholesaler. So it could be uh, costs or acquisition costs plus 5% or acquisition costs plus 1% depending on the volume that you give to the wholesaler. But it's always going to be a less than AWP. Even if it's cost, acquisition costs plus 5%, it's still less than AWP because remember, the spread between AWP and acquisition costs is at least 10 to 15% just for brand drugs and even higher for generic drugs. Okay, a little complicated but something you should know. D, managed care providers. Uh, HMO, Health Maintenance Organization. So in the United States, an HMO is a medical insurance group that provides health services for a fixed annual fee. And it is an organization that provides or arranges managed care for health insurance and self-funded health care benefit plans, individuals, and other entities. Um, acting as a liaison with health care providers, uh, such as hospitals, doctors, etc., on a prepaid basis. So the patient picks his primary care physician in an HMO, otherwise known as a PCP, uh, within the HMO network. And then the PCP then will also refer patients to a specialist when needed. Uh, so the PCP is actually the gatekeeper in an HMO system and directs all medical care for the member after they see them for their initial um, visit and diagnosis. And then they allow the patient to go see a dermatologist or an ophthalmologist or a cardiologist, etc. Um, page three. One, the goal of an HMO is to keep patients healthy. So HMOs are really good at health and wellness. What they're not really good at, or, you know, I'm, I guess this is kind of an unfair statement, but they're not as good as like, let's say, a PPO is when you really get sick and you have some kind of a major medical um, episode or situation. Two, protected health care instead of reactive, I mean, I'm sorry, proactive health care instead of reactive health care. They're really good at proactive keeping you healthy, uh, health and wellness. It's based on a capitation reimbursement, right? A set fee, set monies every month, and for that uh, money in return, they're going to give you services. Uh, it provides a predictable cost of payment for services. There is little flexibility in selection of providers because there's only so many providers in the HMO. Healthcare providers work directly for the HMO. So like, let's say, at a, a large HMO like Kaiser Foundation or Kaiser Permanente, all the doctors, pharmacists, uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, they all work for the HMO. Um, small copays and usually no deductibles with HMOs, although now they're starting to incorporate deductibles because health insurance in general is just getting out of hand. It's out of hand, out of control in the United States. We need to have a single-payer program like Medicare. We need to be a socialist country like the Scandinavian countries and get free health care like them. And then low premiums, they're usually lower premiums. B, large HMOs in the U.S. include Kaiser Permanente, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Anthem, HealthNet, Aetna, Humana, and Cigna. Um, so Kaiser is in a class by itself. They're their own beast or behemoth or monster, whatever you want to call them, because they are also their own insurance company. Unlike a network like the other HMOs, Kaiser has its own hospitals uh, throughout certain states in the United States, especially on the West Coast, where they started. Um, every medical and pharmaceutical service they provide is an in-house distributed by their hospitals. They have their own hospitals. Okay, two. PPO, write it in or type it in. PPO stands for Preferred Provider Organization. Preferred Provider Organization. So in the United States, a PPO is a managed care organization of medical doctors, hospitals, and other health care providers who have all come to agree with an insurer or a third party administrator to provide health care at reduced rates to the insurer's or administrator's clients. It is essentially a subscription-based medical care arrangement. It's a membership, a membership that allows a substantial discount below the regularly charged rates for the designated professionals partnered with the organization. OK, 
Okay, so it's a little bit different than an HMO. Um, a lot of these doctors are in private practice. Okay, they don't work for the HMO. PPOs earn money by charging an access fee to the insurance company for the use of their network, unlike the usual insurance with premiums and corresponding payments paid either in full or partially by the insurance provider uh, to the medical doctor. Page four. So, uh, in sum, PPOs provide healthcare services to members at a discounted fee for services. The network of providers uh, have a non-exclusive contract with the PPO. Uh, members pay a copay at, time, at the time of service, and often members have a yearly deductible to meet before insurance uh, coverage begins. And what a deductible means is you have uh, the insurance says that you have to spend five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars, whatever that deductible is, out of your pocket before your insurance kicks in. That's what deductible means. So patients pay a copay at the time of service, and then members have this yearly deductible and once met, then the insurance kicks in. Insurance pays a percentage of the medical bills, and members may select a non-PPO provider. But if they do, then the member must pay the difference between the discounted fee that was negotiated with the member provider and a regular fee. The percentage paid by the insurance is lower if services are provided by an out-of-network provider. So you want to try and stay in the network that a PPO um, has signed up. But the advantage is if you want to go see uh, a provider out of your network, you may do so but you're just going to have to pay the higher cost. You can't do that with an HMO. It's a closed uh, network. And no referral is required for specialist services, so that's great. There's no PPP, uh, PCP, primary care provider, that is acting as a gatekeeper. If you want to see a cardiologist or a dermatologist, um, ophthalmologist, whatever, have at it. You can go straight to them without having to go through uh, a PCP first. Three. So what is the difference between an HMO and a PPO? HMOs tend to be more affordable, however you're restricted to their PCPs, their primary care physicians, providers, in their network who then must refer you to any specialist if needed. PPOs are more flexible and provide greater coverage but come with a higher price tag and probably a deductible. Uh, you can also go out of a PPO network to see a doctor and be partially covered if the physician is a non-network provider. Also, a referral often is not needed to see a specialist in a PPO network. <clears throat> okay, point of sale plans. Uh, in a point of, ser a point of service plan, in a point of service plan, POS, members may choose an HMO or a PPO for services. Um, the PCP directs the medical care, a primary care provider. Member, members may see an out-of-network provider if they wish, but there's also a higher cost for out-of-network providers, page 5, and there's also higher premiums. <clears throat> e, HSA, let's talk about this, type it in or write it in, HSA stands for Health Savings Account, Health Savings Account. So HFAs are basically financial accounts established by an individual or family to pay for qualified medical expenses. Um, qualified is anything that's a, a medical expense, dental, vision, um, you know, like going to see an optometrist. Um, those are qualified medical expenses, getting a pair of glasses. Uh, the U.S. federal regulations require citizens to have a minimum deductible on their health insurance from all sources to make tax deductible contributions to their HSAs. You set up an HSA through your employer. But let me state something here. Not all employers offer HSA, so you have to see if your employer through the HR department will offer HSAs. HSAs combine the benefits of both traditional and Roth 401ks and IRAs for medical expenses. Taxpayers receive a 100% income tax deduction on annual contributions. They may withdraw HSA funds tax-free to reimburse themselves for qualified medical expenses, as I discussed earlier. And they may defer taking such reimbursements indefinitely without payments, without penalties. So they can leave the money in there and roll it over to the next year, just like a 401k. Uh, HSA limits change according to tax laws on an annual basis. Um, currently, the limits are $32.50 for individuals and $64.50 for family coverage. Although right now, we just passed this new um, uh, tax law and 
quite honestly, I don't know what the new uh, limits are, but you can just Google it. Uh, HSA can roll over every year with certain restrictions as opposed to an FSA or flexible spending account. In an FSA, you cannot roll the money over. If you don't use it, you lose it. So, six, there can uh, also be an investment tool associated with an HSA, like a low interest savings account. Again, it's similar to a 401k. All right, F, let's talk about FSA's flexible spending account. So an FSA is also a special account that you put money into that you, that you use to pay for certain out-of-pocket health care costs like dental, vision, and child care expenses. Yeah, you can even write off child care expenses. Uh, you don't pay taxes on this money. So this means you'll save an amount equal to the taxes you would have paid on the amount you set aside. However, the disadvantage is that FSAs cannot be rolled over to the next year and must be used by the end of the year. So you really have to pay attention to your FSA account if you have one established through your employer because they're going to take the money out tax-free. So always plan to use up all your money in your FSA account before the end of the year because if you don't, poof, it disappears. You'll never see it again. Page six, private plans. So private plans are just plans offered by insurance companies in the private open market. The patient obtains a prescription drug card from a PBM, pharmacy benefits manager, and these are often costlier than HMOs or PPOs. So a private plan would be um, Obamacare, right, ACA, otherwise known as ACA. There are some people, ignorant people, who think that ACA is a different plan than Obamacare. The ACA is the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. And those are just uh, all different private insurances that uh, an individual can go online to, to purchase. Self-pay. Um, some patients are responsible for the full price of their prescriptions. So in, in these situations, the patients may pay with cash, check, credit, or debit card. In other words, self-pay is private pay is cash. It's cash. It's also known as usual and customary, UNC. Um, I, federally funded health care programs. One, CMS. This is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This is a federal bureaucracy. Two, CMS is the federal government and covers over 100 million people in the United States. It is a federal agency within the United States Department of Health and Human Services that administers the Medicare program and works in partnership with state governments to administer Medicaid, the state's children health insurance program, which is SCHIP, um, which was a big battle in Congress uh, just to get it reapproved for another four or five years, and then in health insurance portability standards. So uh, Medicare and Medicaid both come under CMS. We'll talk about right, Medicare right now. So Medicare blank covers prescription drugs, biologicals, insulin, vaccines, and select medical supplies for patients. Not all medications are covered under Medicare Part D, and that's the blank. So in the beginning, Medicare blank is Medicare Part D. Type that in. Write it in. And it's easy to remember because Part D, D, just remember D stands for drugs. Medicare Part D pays for drugs. Medicare Part B, as in boy, covers most medically necessary doctors or services, preventive care, durable medical equipment, hospital outpatient services, lab tests, and mental health care. For pharmacies, this is where insulin, glucose meters, and test strips are billed. Please know this for the exam. Glucose test strips and diabetic um, insulin glucose mm -hmm. meters or monitors are not covered under Medicare Part D. They're not considered drugs. They are considered durable medical equipment, and so therefore it's covered under Part B. So if you see a question like that, which Medicare plan covers glucose test strips and uh, glucose test monitors, the answer is Part B for Medicare. Part C. Part C is not a separate benefit and allows a private health insurance company to prov provide Medicare benefits. So these Medicare private health plans, such as HMOs and PPOs, are known as Medicare Advantage plans. Page 7. Um, Medicare Part A is a hospital insurance, um, is hospital insurance and helps cover inpatient care in hospitals, <coughs> including cri uh, critical access hospitals and skilled nursing facilities. 
So if your grandmother, your mom or dad ends up in a skilled nursing facility or a SNF home, that's the we call, so we call skilled nursing facilities, Medicare Part A covers that. Um, it's not custodial or long-term care. It, it also helps cover hospice care and some home health care. And then E is a Medigap. So this is Medicare supplement policy. It's an additional policy that covers the gaps in the original Medicare program. Um, so Medigap is like you can buy additional insurance when you fall into the donut hole in your Medicare plan. So a tip, just know Medicare is Part D and um, B for the PTCE. Uh, but you should know Part A, just know that that's for hospital, that's the hospital insurance. I've never seen them ask a question about it, but you know what, it's game if it's, if it's uh, part of their blueprint. Three, Medicaid. Don't get mixed up with Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid in the U.S. is a social health care program for families and individuals with limited resources. So these are basically people who are on welfare. Uh, these programs are administered at the blank level. Type it in or write it in at the state level. These programs are administered at the state level. So an example in California is uh, the Medicaid program is called Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal is California's Medicaid. Other states call it Medicaid. Uh, there might be a state out there that may call it something other than Medicaid, like California, they call it Medi-Cal. Um, a, this federal program is based on income and other circumstances. B, each state determines its own eligibility rules, services provided, and co-pays. C, eligibility is determined on a month-by-month -month basis because people's uh, financial situations change every month. And D, in most situations, Medicaid covers physician visits, emergency care, hospital care, vaccinations, prescription drugs, vision, hearing, long-term care, and preventive care for children. <clears throat> J, Pharmacy Provider Networks, PPNs. One, a network. So a network is essentially a group of healthcare providers linked by a contract to provide um, healthcare services to its members. Two, Community Pharmacy Network. These consist of both chains and independent pharmacies and may be either an open, like any community pharmacy may participate, or closed, only select community pharmacies may participate. Three, in-house network, let's go to page eight, in-house network. Uh, a, this is a pharmacy owned by an HMO. For instance, Kaiser, they have their own in-house pharmacy. Okay, that would, be in, uh, that would be an example. B, normally it's located in the HMO facility, or like in Kaiser's case, it's located in their hospitals. C, provides pharmacy services only for members of the network. An example of this is Kaiser. I'm just using Kaiser because it's the easiest example. Um, their pharmacy services sit under the Kaiser Foundation plan and only services just their members. They don't service out people from outside who come off of the street. Four, mail order pharmacy network. So a mail order pharmacy owned and operated by a managed care organization. Members obtain their filled prescriptions through the mail. In some situations, members may be eligible to obtain prescriptions from a community pharmacy. Only chronic meds or maintenance type drugs, diabetes medications, uh, blood pressure medications, heart medications, only chronic meds uh, that have refills can be filled at mail order pharmacies. Because think about it, you can't fill an acute drug, you can't fill an antibiotic or a pain med that you need right now. You still gotta wait for it to come in the mail. Obviously for logistical reasons, an acute medication like an antibiotic will have to be filled at a community retail pharmacy. Five, physician dispensing network. Uh, this is not that important, but we'll talk about it, then you won't be tested. These are physicians who dispense medications from their offices. How dare they? Uh, they are very limited in dispensing meds because of the large inventory required by a pharmacy. Um, there are now pilot vending machines that actually dispense drugs in these, uh, dr in these uh, doctor's offices. K, formulary usage in managed care. I think we talked about formularies, but we're going to talk about it here. So a blank, write it in or type it in, a formulary, F-O-R-M-U-L-A-R-Y, is a list of medications approved for use or reimbursement under a prescription plan. 
It also pertains to a list of drugs that a hospital uses and is determined by the hospital's pharmacy and therapeutics committee, the P&T, of that hospital. So every drug insurance company has their own formulary. This is a list of drugs that only that insurance company will pay for. And the, uh, the way they determine it is that the insurance companies also have their own P&T committee. These P&T committees are very powerful. They have, they, the reason why they're very powerful is because they determine which drugs uh, that, that the hospital or the insurance companies are going to use. So if you're a drug manufacturer, you could get left out. And so there's a lot of, you know, under the table stuff that's going on here with influencing people on the P&T committee. Two, each managed care organization determines its own formulary to be used. And three, it is used to control prescription costs. Page nine. Uh, open formulary, so this includes a variety of several medications in each therapeutic classification. In addition, multiple tiers of pricing may be used. In a multiple tier system, there will be a distinct price for branded drugs, generic drugs, lifestyle drugs like cosmetic drugs, and drugs not covered by the formulary. So an open formulary is open. There's more drugs that are going to be uh, on the list that will be covered or used by the hospital. Five, closed formulary. This is the most common type. This is a very limited number of drugs available with a limited number of medications available in each therapeutic classification. Um, in some situations, an entire drug classification may not be available. However, an exception process is in place, which is called prior authorization. Uh, restricted formulary. So uh, this is a selective, limited, partially closed formulary in which some non-formulaic medications are available and an exception process does occur. Seven, <clears throat> formulary exception process. So this is a process that allows the right to use select um, non-formulary and formulary medications to be dispensed. A, there's, there's a formulary override. So it's a process that requires a physician to request approval prior, prior off. Uh, to prescribe a non-formulary medication and to document the reason for the medication, like the doctor already used these other medications and they failed, or the patient gets sick on this medication, therefore he needs the one that's not in the formulary, etc. You get my drift. The prior authorization process. So this is to obtain authorization to use select non-formulary drugs that require the physician to request and document the reason why the medication is needed. So again, for the same reasons, right? The, uh, the ones that I prescribed that were on formulary didn't work, it failed, or the patient had an allergy, whatever. There's several reasons for a prior uh, reason. Um, L, online adjudication. So anytime you push the button to fill the prescription and you're in a retail pharmacy uh, or in a skilled nursing facility, it goes to the insurance company for adjudication. So this is the process by which a pharmacy submits prescription claims to the insurance company electronically to a third party provider um, when filling a prescription to ensure accurate co payments and timely payment. Online adjudication provides an immediate response from Medicare Part D, Medicaid, and other insurance providers. It provides coverage information, reimbursement rates, and co pays, and in addition, it allows a pharmacy to verify a patient's eligibility and to determine the plan name, patient identification, and group number. So that's online adjudication. It, it, you do it by a computer, you send off the information to the third party administrator or insurance, and then they spit back the information. This is the copay, uh, or this is not covered, or this patient is not covered. So um, you'll know right away as soon as you submit the claim online, online adjudication. Okay, number 10, page 10, number two above. All pharmacies must possess a national provider identifier. Um, NPI. Also, all physicians and all other providers, dentists, what, um, nurse practitioners, um, physician assistants, they all must have their own NPI, National Provider Identifier, including the pharmacies. So this is, a, which is a unique number assigned to healthcare providers to transmit health information according to the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or if you remember, HIPAA. Um, M, prescription processing, claims processing. One, information contained on a prescription drug card. So this includes the bin, 
the bank identification number. This is the six digit number used to identify the company that will reimburse the pharmacy for the prescription being filled. So usually on the prescription insurance card, uh, it has the bin number on there. And so in case you don't know, you've never heard of the insurance company, uh, then you just look for the bin number and you can search the bin number in the computer system, pharmacist's computer system, and it will tell you what insurance it is. Um, what else did I want to say here <clears throat> about the bin number? Uh, yeah, so there are health insurance cards, medical cards, and there's prescription drug insurance cards. These are quite often two different cards that the patient possesses. Sometimes the medical card and the prescription drug card is the same insurance card, but most often they're two separate cards. So sometimes the, the patient gets mixed up and they'll come to the pharmacy and they'll give you their medical card and that doesn't have any information about prescription drug coverage. The prescription drug coverage card has to have the VIN number on there, the patient's ID number, the uh, group number, the plan number, the person code, all those things that we're going to talk about here. B, plan code. It's a prescription provider. C is the group code. That's the employer that contracted the insurance company for the policy. So they, that each employer has their own group number. D, the issuer. This is the health insurance company who issued the card. Aetna, HealthNet, Blue Cross, etc. Uh, e is the ID. It may be either alpha, uh, either numeric or alpha numeric. In the old days, we used to use the social security number of the patient, but now because of you know, security reasons and people getting um, their information hijacked, now the insurance companies will issue a unique uh, numeric or alphanumeric number as the ID card for the insurance card, as the ID number for the insurance card. Um, F, subscriber, cardholder, uh, name, the individual who purchased the policy. So that's the subscriber, it's the one who, whose insurance uh, is, it's under. So the prescriber will be the, the, the employee of the company, and then maybe his or her spouse will be also on the plan, and the children will be on the plan. So the subscriber is the person paying for the plan. Primary care provider, this is the PCP. This, this is optional depending on the plan. Co-pays, so it may be identified in the card but not required, and it's often tiered for brand, generic, and preferred brands. So normally you'll see it in the card, $10 for generic, $25 for brand, $50 for non-preferred brand. That means that's what you mean by tiered copays. I is also a help desk phone number. Um, J dispenses written codes. This is used to ensure the pharmacy is properly reimbursed by a third-party provider for the prescription being dis uh, dispensed. DAW or dispenses written is, uh, has different codes, which I'm going to go through right now. But uh, DNS is also DAW. DNS stands for do not substitute, which is the same as DAW dispenses written. So if, if, if in the, there's a DAW code, a field in the computer system when you're typing, uh, if you put a, a zero, that means no product selection was indicated, so you can just give the generic if it's available. Or one, this, was, this is important, substitution not allowed by the provider. A DAW1 or DNS1 is a substitution not allowed. So in other words, the doctor wants only the brand to be dispensed, even if there's a generic. Very significant because otherwise the insurance company is not going to pay you for the brand unless they see that DAW1 in the DAW field. DAW2 is substitution allowed, but the patient requested the product to be dispensed. So in this case, the patient wants the brand name drug. They don't want the generic. And the consequence to the patient for that is the insurance company doesn't care. They don't give respect to the patient. They only respect the doctor. If the patient requested a DAW, they're still going to charge them the higher price. Very few plans will allow the patient to dictate the price of the copay for a brand drug. Um, three is substitution allowed. Pharmacists selected the product dispense. Four is substitution allowed. Generic drug not in stock. Um, let's go to page 11. Five, substitution allowed. Brand drug dispenses generic. Six is an override. Seven. Substitution not allowed, brand drug mandated by law. Um, eight, substitution allowed, generic drug not available in the marketplace, and nine is other. So for the exam, just know zero, one, and two, okay? 
Zero is no DAW. One is the physician says no, do not substitute or dispense is written. And two, the patient says do not substitute or dispense is written. Maybe you should also know number eight because this is this happens quite often where the substitution is allowed because the generic drug is not available in the marketplace. That happens quite often where for some whatever reason that there's no raw materials for the generic drug. It's just not available in the marketplace. So you have to dispense the brand. Um, 8.2, third-party resolution. So these include prior authorization, rejected claims, and plan limitations. A, the terms above should be known to every pharmacy technician since 95% of all prescriptions are paid for by insurance these days. There's very few patients that pay out-of-pocket or cash for prescriptions. Um, B, prior authorization. So the prior authorization process for drug insurance companies, third-party administrators and pharmacy benefits managers, PBMs, are all similar. If a drug is blank, right, write it in or top it in, or type it in. If a drug is non-formulary, that is a drug is not, that is that the drug is not on their list of covered drugs. It's not on their formulary list. Then the pharmacy must submit a prior authorization to the insurance to get approval to dispense the drug to the patient. The PA process will follow a protocol by the insurance. Often the reason has not only to do with medical justification, uh, but that a familiar, some similar formulary drug failed with the patient's medical treatment. So like I said before, the doctor has to be able to provide an excuse saying, the formulary drug doesn't work, it failed for the patient, the patient got nausea and vomiting, the patient's allergic to the formulary drug, whatever reason in order to get the prior off. A, prior authorization requires a physician to obtain approval from a managed care organization for a specific medication before it is dispensed by the pharmacy. B, situations that may require a prior auth include brand name medications that have a generic available, expensive medications, uh, medications with age limits such as Retin-A, drugs used for cosmetic purposes such as Propecia you know, for hair loss, and Retin-A is also for cosmetic use too. Uh, page 12. Medications such as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra prescribed for non-life-threatening medical conditions. So apparently ED, erectile dysfunction, is non-life-threatening. <laughs> Six. Drugs not usually covered by the insurance company, but said to be medically necessary by the physician. Physicians have a lot of power here in the prior auth process. Um, seven, medicines that are usually covered by the insurance company, but are being used at a higher dose than normal. Okay. C, rejected claims. So these are claims that are rejected by the prescription insurance company, third party administrator, or PBM, pharmacy benefits manager. The NCP DP stands for the National Council for Prescription Drug Programs and is an ANSI certified standards development organization providing healthcare solutions. So with regard to rejected claims, uh, NCPDP provides accepted standards for rejection codes for pharmacies adjudicating insurance claims online. Because you can imagine if there wasn't a standard, all hell would break loose. It would be, you know, everyone would define their own rejection codes all throughout the United States. So, NCB, NCPDP is a good thing, right? Because it's a standard. They, they develop the standards. Three, when a prescription rejects, rejects from the payer, the pharmacy will receive the reject code, the reject code. And it is not important to know the number because the system will also give a reason uh, or reject, or reject uh, description. They'll give the description to, as to why it rejected. So you don't have to know the number. Uh, the pharmacy must correct the claim before resubmitting it to the managed care provider or insurance or third-party insurance, third-party administrator, or whatever. A, the more common rejects are missing or invalid gen uh, gender code. You got to put male or female in the, in the field. Missing or invalid date of birth. Got to put the date of birth of the patient. Missing or invalid patient relationship code. So, O1 is the card holder. Usually, that's the person, person who pays for the insurance. O2 is the spouse who's on the insurance. And then O3, O4, O5, etc., those are the children, however how many children you have. The oldest is O3, the next oldest is O4, etc. Sometimes they use 00 instead of 01 for the cardholder. I've seen that also. But anyway, that's a relationship code. And it usually says it on the prescription drug insurance card 
uh, that card holder, every card holder in the family has their own card and it tells them, it says on the, on the card what, what the patient code is, uh, patient relationship code. And then missing or invalid card holder ID. Maybe you put the card holder ID incorrectly, so you've got to make sure that that uh, reflects the same exact ID that's on the card. Missing or invalid group number. Most insurances need the group number to bill uh, for the for the prescription drug. So, and it says the group uh, the group uh, the group number is on the card. It says it right there. Or the patient is not covered. Their insurance expired. Or missing or invalid version number. Um, page 13, or missing or invalid transaction code, the missing DEA number by the physician. Remember that the physicians uh, for DEA numbers are very unique. It's a unique um, identifier for them. Uh, missing or invalid pharmacy number. Pharmacies have what's called an NABP number, so it has to have that. Missing or invalid BIN. Remember the six-digit number, uh, bank identification number has to, has to be processed. Missing or invalid dispenses written. So maybe you forgot to put 0, 1, or 2. Uh, you have to put something in the DAW field. Missing or invalid prescriber ID. So maybe they, the prescriber has a special ID that the insurance company wants. Or you know, it's, maybe it's their NPI number. Remember NPI numbers? And then missing or invalid unit of measure. You got the wrong measurement in there. Everything is billed by metric quantity. All right, D plan limitations. So plan limitations are intended to control drug use and return and reduce drug costs and is also a method of determining uh, plan savings. So plan limits, uh, plan limits rejections occur when the claim is beyond the patient's plan requirements for the drug. And this is called prescription limitations and could include A, the claim exceeds the day's limit. For example, trying to exceed a 90-day supply when the patient's plan only covers 30 days, right? Let's say the, the SIG was one a day and the insurance only covers 30 days, so you can only give 30 tablets or capsules. If you try to bill for 60 or 90, you're going to get a reject for day's limit, exceeding the day's limit. B, the patient's insurance requires that the patient receive their chronic meds through mail order. That's a bummer. Um, after the first two fills at the local pharmacy. So if they try to fill a chronic med the third time, uh, the insurance wants to save money and they're going to force the patient to go through mail order. I don't think that's right. I think the, the patient really should have a right as to where they fill their prescriptions. C, drug benefit limitations is a dollar amount. It has a maximum amount that can be spent at one time on a prescription. Uh, another limitation is maximum number of prescriptions that can be dispensed to a member over a period of time, normally monthly. So, for instance, like uh, Viagra, they only pay for four tablets a month, one time. If the, uh, they, and they won't pay for any more than four. I'm just like saying for one insurance company, it may, it may be that kind of plan limitation. All right, three, the Medicare donut hole. So, most Medicare drug plans have a coverage gap. And we say the patient has fallen into this donut hole. And this means that there's a temporary limit on what the drug plan will cover for drugs. Page 14. B. So if the patient has gone past their limit, in other words, Medicare says, we're only going to cover $2,000 for your drugs for a whole year. And after $2,001, you fall into this donut hole. Hey, rah, rah, too bad for you. Now you're going to have to pay cash out of pocket for your prescriptions till the end of the year. So there is insurance available to cover the donut hole, uh, to cover them when they enter the donut hole, and this is called um, Medigap. So C, the coverage gap begins after the patient and their drug plan have spent a certain amount for covered drugs, and then this amount changes from year to year. And so they, they can buy the donut hole coverage or Medigap to cover them once they fall into the donut hole. In certain states like California, Medicaid institutes a six prescription per month limit for the patient, otherwise known as Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal institutes the six prescription limit. And once they go past six prescriptions, then a prior authorization uh, process must be employed to get coverage for the patient until the end of the month. 8.3, <clears throat> third-party reimbursement systems, for example, PBMs, Pharmacy Benefits Manager, medication assistance programs, coupons, and self-pay. All right, A, what is a pharmacy benefits manager or PBM? 
PBMs focus on pharmacy services provided under a health care plan and contracts with an insurer to provide prescription drugs to members, usually through community pharmacies. A PBM is a third-party administrator. That's all they are. Uh, they're a third-party administrator of prescription drug programs for commercial health plans, self-insured employer plans, Medicare Part D, uh, the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, and state government employee uh, plans. Uh, they are prim primarily responsible for developing and maintaining the formulary, contracting with pharmacies, negotiating discounts and rebates with drug manufacturers, and process and pay, uh, paying prescription drug claims. As of 2016, PBMs manage pharmacy benefits for 266 million Americans who have health insurance from a variety of sponsors, including commercial health plans, self-insured employer plans, union plans, managed um, Medicaid plans, and others. Um, what else did I want to say about this, about PBMs? Okay, so it covers a lot of people. So like Walgreens, um, they have their own PBM. C CVS has their own PBM. It's called Caremark. You've probably heard of it. Uh, Rite Aid has their own PBM. It's called uh, Envision. And so uh, these chain pharmacies are now starting to have their own PBMs. It makes them more competitive. Three, the terms PBM and third-party administrator are used interchangeably along with prescription insurance. However, that's not totally accurate, right? Page 15, what do PBMs do? So PBMs theoretically reduce prescription drug costs and improve convenience and safety for consumers, employers, unions, and government programs. How do PBMs reduce drug costs? Uh, they offer Amazon-style home delivery of medications like mail order and create uh, select networks of more affordable pharmacies. They encourage the use of generics and more affordable brand medications. Uh, they're actively managing these formularies. They negotiate rebates from drug manufacturers and discounts from drug stores. They manage high-cost specialty medications like AIDS drugs or um, a lot of the uh, biomed uh, drugs. Um, and they reduce waste and improve adher adherence. B, medication assistance program. Medication assistance programs are also known as prescription assistance programs. So these are programs sponsored by the drug companies. Um, states, doctors, patient advocacy organizations, and civic groups. And it helps low-income, uninsured uh, patients to get free or low-cost uh, brand-name medications that they need in order to sustain life in some situations. Typically, a patient will fill out an application for a drug that they need, that they desperately need, and send it to the drug company who makes the drug. The drug company then reviews the application and determines if the patient fulfills the requirements, their protocol, to receive the drug free or at a substantial reduction in price. The patient's doctor provides the information about the patient's disease and prescription requirements. So these are medication assistance programs. C, coupons. Sometimes it's just a coupon. Coupons are typically distributed by drug manufacturers to help defer the cost of the medication to the patient, or they want to introduce their drug uh, to the patient, uh, so that, that's you know couponing, just like anything else that you uh, get coupons for. Page 16 at the top. Two, some drug manufacturers provide coupons for specific drug products to physicians, so this is an incentive for physicians. The physician distributes these coupons to patients when they receive new prescriptions. Three, the coupon is for the original fill filling of just the new prescription, not for refills usually. The pharmacy bills the drug manufacturer electronically for the value of the coupon. So this coupon is like a prescription drug card. It has uh, a temporary bin number on there, the group number, uh, a temporary ID. And so you use that coupon just as if it was a prescription drug card. The pharmacy technician, you, will type it all into the computer system and then adjudicate it electronically. Um, so the, the pharmacy bills the drug manufacturer electronically for the value of the coupon. The value of the coupon is deducted from what the patient is responsible for paying. So it could be anywhere from just the percentage to the complete cost of the drug. Six, in situations when a patient has a third-party prescription plan, 
The value of the coupon is deducted from the cost of the prescription being billed to the insurance provider. D. Self-pay. Self-pay is a cash-paying pa patient or customer. These are dinosaurs, right? 90, not more than probably 90 to 95 percent now of patients who get uh, prescription drugs are covered by some kind of insurance. It used to be that uh, 95 percent of people paid for ca paid cash for their prescription drugs, and then they would uh, fill out a claim form and send it to their insurance companies. But it's not like that anymore. These patients either typically do not have prescription insurance or pay for the drug up front and then submit a reimbursement form to their insurance company, but those are rare. Um, Self-pay is also known as cash, cash paying customers or private pay customers and the price of the prescription is determined by the pharmacy's usual and customary price for a cash prescription. So let's get this right now. Self-pay is the same as a cash pay patient, is the same as a private pay patient, is the same as UNC. UNC is the usual and customary price that a pharmacy will charge. Again, private pay, cash, self-pay, UNC. All the same name for the same type of patient. Um, the, formula, the formula to calculate a price for cash is usually AWP. There's no discount, right, because the, the, the pharmacy wants to maximize their profit. So it's just the average wholesale price plus some kind of dispensing fee. Uh, B, the UNC term is interchangeable with cash or private pay, just like I said, and so note this. Sometimes the question on the exam will say, what kind of plan is a UNC? And it'll give you choices. You know, uh, it's a third-party insurance. It's a, it's a federally funded insurance. Uh, look for the one that just says cash or private pay. E, deductibles. So a predetermined amount of money, I already talked about this, that must be spent on prescriptions or even health care in general uh, before copayment begins. So every insurance, uh, especially if their PPOs, have different levels of deductibles. So let's say if it's a $1,000 deductible, it means you've got to spend $1,000 in your health care before the insurance kicks in. Uh, but not, not all prescription plans have deductibles. Usually PPOs do, though, and now some HMOs do, even Kaiser. Um, five, types of copayments. There's a fixed copayment. So this is a predetermined fixed or predetermined dollar amount per prescription fill. So remember it says on the card $10 for generic, $25 for brand, $50 for non-preferred brand. That's a fixed payment. Or it could be a percentage copayment. Those are rare, but you still see those. And that's a predetermined fixed percentage of the cost of the prescription. So they'll pay a 10% copay, 20% copay, whatever uh, the plan, <coughs> whatever the plan says. All right, let me get a sip here. I'm losing my voice. All right, three, <coughs> variable copayment. So a variable or, or a different payment based on the type of drug being dispensed. Examples of classification uh, use include generic drug, preferred brand name drug, non-preferred brand name drug, and lifestyle drug. Uh, variable copayments encourage use of generic drugs and formulary drugs and provides greater access to the drugs for the member but it makes them responsible for higher copays. So this in effect lowers the cost of prescription drug benefit to the employer and shifts more of the burden or drug cost to the member or patient. So it wants to give them a little bit of incentive to try and pay for the lower cost generic drugs. Okay, 8.4, insurance reimbursement systems. Uh, these include uh, home health, long-term care, and home infusion. So the healthcare reimbursement system is an extremely complex framework. Even President Trump said that he never knew healthcare was that complicated. Um, it's an extremely complex framework of obtaining payment for services. One of the most problematic issues is that the rules of governing health care reimbursement change frequently, almost daily it seems like, uh, with government payers sometimes changing on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the most common types is managed care reimbursement. B, health care reimbursement to doctors and hospitals, page 18. One, health care providers are paid by insurance or government payers through a system of reimbursement. They provide medical services to a patient and then file for reimbursement for those services with the insurance company or government agencies such as Medicare and Medicaid. 
C. Capitation is paying a fixed prepaid fee per person to provide a range of health services. So it's paid before the services are provided. So you pay like a monthly insurance fee, right? Monthly bill. That's your capitation. D. Fee for service. This is the most traditional payment method model for health care reimbursement, whereby fee for service requires patients or payers to reimburse the health care provider for each service performed. In other words, it is a set fee paid for each type of service that is performed and is paid at the time of service. But see, these days, most people have insurance, right? It's been negotiated or at a discounted rate, especially if the doctor is in that patient's PPO, right? Preferred provider network. One, fee-for-service is a payment model where services are unbundled and paid for separately. Um, in healthcare, it gives an incentive for physicians to provide more treatments because payment is dependent on the quantity of care rather than quality of care. E. Medicare reimbursement refers to the payments that hospitals and physicians receive in return for services rendered to Medicare beneficiaries. The reimbursement rates for these services are set by Medicare and are typically less or discounted than the amount billed or the amount that a private insurance company would pay. For home health care. So home health care is basically that. You take, you're taken care of at, at home in the comfort of your own home. Home health care is a wide range of health care services that can be given in a patient's home for illness or injury. Usually it might be like a cancer patient, right? Uh, home health care is usually less expensive, more convenient, and just as effective as care you get in a hospital skilled nursing facility. So usually there is a nurse or a hospice care unit that comes to the house to see how you're doing and help take care of you. Page 19. A. Medicare doesn't cover home health care service, uh, uh, aid services unless you're also getting skilled care like nursing care or other physical therapy. And remember that was covered under Medicare Part A. Um, so it usually doesn't, uh, remember, it doesn't cover home health care services unless you're also getting skilled care, uh, skilled nursing or physical therapy, occupational therapy or speech language pathology services from the home health care agency. Home health care is provided by licensed health care professionals like a nurse. G, long-term care, LTC. Long-term care is a range of services and support for a patient's personal care needs. Most long-term care isn't medical, but rather help with basic personal tasks of everyday life, sometimes called activities of daily living. Long-term care insurance policies typically cover basic daily needs over an extended period. Um, while health care insurance or Medicare helps pay for immediate medical expenses, say a surgeon's bill, uh, long-term care insurance helps people cope with the cost of chronic illnesses, such as Alzheimer's disease or, or various other types of disabilities. Um, three, Medicare by itself pays for a limited amount of long-term supportive services. Medicare covers up, covers up to 100 days, 100 days of care in a nursing home or skilled nursing facility, sniff home, after you have spent three days in the hospital and as long as the patient needs skilled care. So that's the rule. They have to spend three days in the hospital and after they do, then their Medicare insurance will cover up to 100 days of care in a nursing home. After that, the patient has to fit the bill. H, home infusion. So this is basically IVs at home rather than in a skilled nursing facility or in the hospital. So infusion therapy um, intravenous is when medication is delivered through a needle or catheter into a vein. Home infusion therapy is when a patient receives this therapy outside the hospital or clinical setting. Okay, page 20, the last page, two above. Uh, Medicare does, uh, does pay for infusion drugs provided in the home, but the fact is due to gaps in coverage for the medically necessary services, supplies, and equipment used in the pro uh, provision of uh, infusion therapy. Most Medicare beneficiaries simply do not ha have access to the drugs in the home setting. They, 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 they run out of insurance too quickly because it's expensive to have a home infusion therapy. Um, and at 8.5, coordination of benefits. Basically what this means is it allows plans that provide health and or prescription coverage for a person with Medicare 
to determine their respective payment responsibilities. For instance, it determines which insurance plan has the primary responsibility and the extent to which other plans will contribute when the primary is utilized to the maximum amount. In other words, it's just finding out which insurance is batting first, which one's batting second. When, when the insurance is batting first, when that insurance runs out, then the second insurance will come to play or what's called supplemental insurance. In other words, the process by which a health insurance company determines if it should be the primary or secondary payer of medical claims for a patient who has coverage uh, from more than one health insurance policy. And finally, if a patient has Medicare and other health insurance or coverage, each type of coverage is called a payer. When there's more than one payer, then you have a coordination of benefits rules to decide who pays first. Uh, the primary payer pays what it owes on the patient's bill first and then sends the rest to the secondary payer to pay the balance. That's a long one. That's our longest one. We have one more outline. This is the end of 8.0 Pharmacy Building and Reimbursement. Uh, great job, everyone. Um, I hope you did pause it a few times and take a break. And we are going to our last lecture, which is a short lecture, and then we're done with the blueprint uh, outlines. I'll see you in a bit.